Something you were saying there, you mentioned stuttering. Yeah. Now that's fascinating because that's not a physical thing. That's something that I presume you couldn't just change. So that's psychological then, is it? It's, it's a bit of both, actually, Alex. Um, people who stutter don't breathe in the same way that people who speak normally do. And what, I mean, it, it, it's a number of things, but that's really at the base of it. What uh, pe- people who stutter do is they breathe all the way out, forget to breathe. I mean, try it now, you know, just go, <sighs> breathe out. And then, then try and talk and you, you feel like you want to stutter. So what I do is I get people to surf the breath because um, when you've got that surf going on, it's very easy to speak continuously without you know seemingly having to stop for long. And in addition to that, people who stutter also have linked to lots of fear to the idea of stuttering, so it becomes inevitably a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I teach them the, the appropriate breathing patterns. I also show them how they can overcome it by, um, by creating more confidence. And, and I do it really quickly. I did a stutterer the other day, and this this guy, he's about 80% better. He still stutters a little bit, you know, but 80% improvement and it took me an hour. And so these people that go to the society where they have to spend a year, you know, I say, forget that. There is, I mean, it's very nice, these well-intentioned people who want to help you, it's all lovely, but there are techniques now that can help you significantly reduce your stuttering in a very short space of time. Right, let's move on to smoking now. This is a big contention for me, A, because I can't understand why people smoke. To me, it's revolting. The health facts are proven. There's no question it's bad for you. I can't understand why people do it, but they do. And like my mother, I've begged her and pleaded for her to stop smoking, but she won't. Is it like anything? If they don't want to, you can't change that. Yeah, that's right. They do have to want to. The reason that people smoke is it gives quite a powerful change in feelings. Uh, When we smoke, when someone smokes a cigarette, they get a release of endorphins, the body's natural opiates. Now, there are a lot of good ways to get endorphins outside of smoking. You know, physical exercise does that, you know, anything, you know highly pleasurable I'm sure you know what I'm talking about <laughs> gives you a release of endorphins but also you know appreciating um, uh, nice things you know a beautiful summer's day when you're walking down the street you feel so good you're getting a little release of endorphins there so smokers have you really used cigarettes to give themselves artificial highs uh, from the crude chemicals in a cigarette often to control their stress it's just a really crude stress control mechanism now I don't have any moral stance on this I think if people want to smoke it should be their own business if people want to eat mud it should be their own business I'm not on some crusade to stop people however I have to say that that I agree with you there are serious health risks with smoking you know it's I don't consider it a very sensible functional choice but you know we all do things from time to time that are not that sensible I tried smoking when I was about 12 years old behind the bike sheds and coughed and splut and thought good god this is awful you know even though I want to be like the other tough guys in the school I don't think I'll be doing that Um, so it doesn't appeal to me but I can see why people do it and increasingly people want to stop and you know I'm quite happy to help people stop I mean sometimes people have asked me to help them uh, to um, to quit say alcohol or some people say I just want to be able to have one drink and stop and so again I don't bring any moral judgment to it you know I help them do just you know as much as they want to so I see my job as a facilitator really you know I mean I, I couldn't do something I felt morally opposed to I think you know I think it would be difficult to do that in fact pros- impossible really for me but you know if people want to smoke I think it's their own business however if they want to quit I've got some very good techniques to help them the interesting thing about smoking to me is that I've read a lot of research about how addictive it is and there is some contradiction about that well there's two things there is um, definitely a physiological addiction there is no doubt about that and the cravings are simply this if you've been telling your body to release endorphins um, through chemicals and then suddenly you take that chemical messenger away uh, when a a situation that you'd normally get your endorphin release from a cigarette for like say just you know a, a meeting where you want to calm yourself down or an argument or a moment when you're bored or if you use cigarettes to reward yourself after you've done something and suddenly you don't have that your body's going to be going into a sort of a you're going to feel cranky you're going to go into a craving mode because the endorphins will be sitting around in your bloodstream looking at their watches going well we haven't had the signal yet you know every day has its emotional ups and downs you know some things make us tense some some get us bored some relax some all kinds of different things and cigarettes take the, the kind of peaks and the troughs off our experience experience yeah and it um, it's a case of us getting um, artificial highs um, and lifts from cigarettes 
And when we take that away, suddenly that cushion to our emotions and to life is removed. And so it feels a little bit weird at first. And what the hypnotist or the modern psychologist can do is reduce that so there isn't a craving. And so you feel so relaxed without cigarettes and then the rest is up to you. You can also put a little bit of aversion in there too. You can get somebody to think of things they don't like and link that to cigarettes. And that's probably a good idea. You know, I mean, it, you know, it's not that I think necessarily when I, if I think about smoking of the Marlboro Cowboy, because some people uh, do and they think, yeah, tough guy, rugged. Well, I don't think to myself that the guy died of lung cancer and hold that idea strongly in my mind. You know, one of the reasons that people that are heavy smokers uh, find it difficult to, to, to quit, even though their doctor tells them, is because they've used cigarettes to calm themselves down. And then, you know, they see all these ads on TV, you know, or, or for example, the packaging now that says smoking kills you. And they go, God, God, this is going to kill me. I better have a cigarette to calm down because I'm freaking out. The cigarette company companies are really cynical about this. They know that, oh yes, we'll put warnings on our cigarettes because they know it's going to make the poor smokers smoke more, you know, because, and they're not bad people and they're not wrong. You know, I don't, I don't think that they're wrong. They're just using cigarettes as a crutch uh, to help them, you know, through those stressful times. Problem is with smoking and stopping smoking, of course, is they'll need you again because with most people who I've met who have stopped, they then get fat because they start eating stuff so they're going to need you yeah. again. Well, this is, again, this is something that the cigarette companies have been very happy to let everyone know about is if you, if you quit smoking you might put on weight now if you quit smoking without some kind of assistance particularly some kind of psychological hip uh, assistance like hypnosis which incidentally is proven to be the single most effective way of uh, quitting smoking in the world then if you just do it with willpower there there is a chance that you might try and control your feelings with food as opposed to cigarettes but if you control if you go to the cause rather than the symptoms and you get your emotions under greater control through psychological techniques like hypnosis and NLP then you won't put on the weight you know the vast majority that quit of people that quit smoking using my system do not put on weight this isn't just you making money is it you're serious that you really can help people well uh, I am making money yes I'm quite happy about that and proud of it and I suggest that everyone else does too uh, the Change Your Life book has a section on how to increase your wealth and I would say not a week goes by without somebody walking up to me in the street going do you know I've doubled my earnings since I read your silly book and I go well I'm not surprised because the principles in it are very very simple if you read a chapter a day because it's seven chapters seven days and there's a CD that comes with it your mind will start to get focused on how you can make more money and you know you will be, an, you will be more confident more motivated more optimistic and uh, ultimately more successful. I believe that success and happiness are not accidents that sort of randomly happen to some people and not to others. Success and happiness are created through certain ways of thinking and acting. And when people say, but how can you change your life in seven days? I go, look, your life can change in a moment. You know, we've all had the experience of meeting a particular person or, you know, having a particular event occur. And in that moment, our life changed. Well, if you do these things, very simple things over the course of seven days, I can guarantee you will be, you do anything for seven days, you're going to be different. But if you do the things I'm suggesting, you'll be significantly different and for the better. The I Can Make You Thin book, well, this is the current number one bestseller in the UK. I'm very proud of this. It has the most extraordinary success rate. Diets don't work. Diets work for less than 10% of people. More than 91% of people fail at dieting. And you know what they do? They think, oh, it was my fault because I'm rubbish because I didn't have any willpower. No, you are going against the way you are biologically programmed as a human being. Diets are a con. Diets don't work because they get you to starve yourself, yes? And you have to go along to the little weight loss group that you belong to and step on the sh scales of shame, don't you? And make, be made to feel wrong for it and I tell you it makes me mad if it, if it just didn't work that would be bad enough but 30% of dieters actually end up larger after they come off the diet than before they started it so what I say to people is forget about dieting forever if you want to lose weight and keep the weight off the only way you are going to do that is if you change your relationship to food if you change how you represent food in your brain weight loss is a behavioral change issue and that is what I do and my system has been independently investigated and the, the uh, findings are astounding. 71% of the people on my system uh, that took part, uh, that, that, you know, were, were part of the um, uh, study uh, lost weight, 71% and kept it off. When I did the other day, Rich and Judy got together a group of people for me and we put them through my system. 90% of them lost weight, you know, so I know that my system works. It works really well. It works better than anything else in the world right now. I'm very proud of it. 
and I'm very passionate, not just be, you know for commercial reasons. You know, I obviously I've made it. Um, uh, for those reasons, but also because I see that people keep getting tricked into doing diets, failing and thinking badly of themselves. And if you want to end that, try my system. It's it's out there. It's in all the bookshops now. It's all the good bookshops. So if you go into a bookshop and they don't have it, it's a bad bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so put your knife and fork down yeah. and listen to your body. When you've had enough, you've had enough. Yeah. Well, slow your eating speed down. That, that I mean, the gist of the system is simple. Uh, when you're hungry, go and eat. Don't never starve yourself. Have what you want, not what you think you should. When you eat, always eat consciously. Put your knife and fork down. Really chew each mouthful about 20 times. And not slowly, just really taste it. And then when you even suspect you're full, stop. You start doing that, the weight will start coming off. Okay. You've had an amazing life and an amazing career so far. You've done arena tours. You've been on Broadway. Uh, you've even been on the show of one of my heroes, Howard Stern. Oh, you yeah. do his show. Now, he's an interesting guy because if you've read his book, he suffers with OCD, this obsessive compulsive disorder syndrome that seems to be sweeping the country and the world. Yeah. Everybody's talking about this. Do you help with people like that oh, as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got OCD, then definitely get in touch with us. We'd love to have you on the show. You know, um, I, I, I really quite like doing the OCD cases. They're fascinating. Yeah. I went out for dinner with a friend of mine last Tuesday and... She locked the door twice on the car. Yeah. And when she opened it, she opened it twice. Mm. And I said, why are you doing that? Oh, I have to do that. When I turn the lights off, I turn them on, turn them off, turn them on, turn them off to turn them off. Yeah. yeah. Where does that come from? Well, it's, um, it's just a bad habit. And, you know, they're not mad, bad, broken. It's just a bad habit. I mean, I, uh, I've seen all kinds of cases of this. You know, somebody who had to polish every light switch you know, had to polish the sink, you know, there couldn't be any little tiny specks of dirt or smears anywhere. You know, some people have to, you know, sit down, they have to get up and touch the fridge 10 times and things like this. It's that human be human beings um, work a bit like a computer. And sometimes a bit of the software in our minds is a bit faulty and that's all it is. And it can be rewritten very easily using techniques like hypnosis and some of the other modern psychological techniques that I employ. Very finally, medical stuff. This is a, an area of controversy as well. Is it self-fulfilling prophecy? Is it if you believe something, it can happen? Are you really the instigator of that, making people feel so good about themselves that it may spur on some reaction? For example, a friend of mine said to me today, ask him, I'm bold, can he make my hair grow back? I mean, is that a stupid question? <laughs> well, if I could, I'd be doing it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what I would say is that we don't know what is possible and what isn't. You know, a lot of the people I work with on a regular basis these days are supposedly, inverted commas, incurable. And so I keep a totally open mind about what can and can't be achieved. Um, I don't know if the hair regrowth can happen. I'd like to, I'd, it's, look, it's, it must be possible, but I don't know how it's done. But there are other things that are at one stage, look at one stage, nothing was curable. And look how many cures we have for things now. I mean, modern medicine is making all kinds of amazing advances. You know, at one stage, there was no world. There was an earth, but you know, there were no buildings and roads and stuff. Look how much there is now. There was no money. There was no technology. There was no education. There were no movies, no music, no theatre. Look how much there is now. We are a highly creative species, and so um, I say, you know, if you want to, if you, if you think what's possible now, uh, you know, open up your imagination and uh, get ready because an exciting future of exponential change is on the way and who knows how amazing that will be the one thing i will say is the brain is a fascinating thing and what you do is mesmerizing to me literally i mean i find it so fascinating how you can change someone's life i mean i know the book is called that and it sounds like i'm being trite but really i mean you are you are literally changing the direction in which people behave and that is to me so fascinating it must be in one way kind of an honor that people trust you enough to allow them to do that oh yeah i feel very lucky very privileged um when i first started doing Doing this work a few years ago, about 20 years ago, uh, it was considered a little bit of a black art. Um, and now my techniques are widely accepted um, in the mainstream of, say, you know, um, uh, bookshops. Um, many of the people who come to my training courses are doctors and psychologists. You know, if people want to know about those, go to paulmckenna.com uh, and you'll see all about the courses that, that I offer. And, and you know, this is what my life will be about. Um, much as I liked playing records and being on the radio years ago, life took me in a different direction. I have a very clear idea of how my life is going to unfold over the next 50 years or so. And um, it's an exciting time. I mean, there'll be challenges too, but I'm, I, f I feel very good about many things. There's still things I want to change. I still have problems and pressures and things like that every day. But overall, I get a great kick from helping people.